they certainly are today. We are back up in Big Bear, finally doing that interview that I promised you all about a year ago. It's finally gonna happen today. Days with Jordan the Lion begins now. And where we're going today is we're going to the house of the man who used to be honorary mayor here in Big Bear and is also known as the man of a thousand voices. We're gonna go visit Noel Blank, the son of Mel Blank. And we always have to pop in and say hi to Louie when we get here. That's just tradition. Well, we are starting out looking in the, what they call the presidential hallway. This is Mel Blank meeting Ronald Reagan. Here's a signed photo of appreciation from President Gerald Ford. And then right here, all of these are from Ronald Reagan to Mel Blanc. The room that we're in now, Noel told me this used to be his bedroom. Now it's his office. Let's take a look around. There's Mel with Sylvester, which was actually his real voice. Right there is Noel working with Jack Palance. And there's Noel working with the great Vincent Price. There's Noel with one of Mel Blanc's best friends and one of his bosses at one time, Jack Benny. There's Noel with Hugh Hefner, Walter Matthau. Then one of my favorite pieces in the whole room, the tribute to father and son. Good in friends with in Kirk December. Douglas. Oh, we went all over the world here. He loved the helicopter. And that's the helicopter we crashed in, by the way. A plane ran into us when we were in the air and put us to the ground about 50 feet above the runway. Unfortunately, the two people that hit us died in the crash. And of course, we were pretty, I was really beaten up. They didn't expect me to live. Kirk was, he, he came through it pretty good, and now he's still living. It'll be 103 in December. Wow. Yeah. Many things that you and your father had in common beyond being great voice actors. Almost death. I mean, At death the same in. Age. Yeah. At the same age. Really? It was. 51. We were both 51. And we're 30 years apart. And we, it, it happened 91 and 61. 1990 and 61 for him, and 1991 for me. And we broke approximately all the same bodies. Almost every bone in our body, we both did. And they didn't expect either one of us to live. Wow. So, do you want to talk about what happened to, to your dad? Well, I mean, Dead Man's Curve. On Sunset, right? right? On Sunset Boulevard. A uh, young kid out of UCLA in a big 98 Oldsmobile. Big, that was a big car at that time. And I hit him and his little Aston Martin. He was doing, they said, 27 miles an hour. <sighs> the kid was going about 40, 50, 60 miles an hour around Dead Man's Curve. And... Uh, it, they head on collision. The kid got a scratched knee because that's big car versus little car. Right. And the Aston Martin just folded up and broke basically every bone that you could think of in his body. And the same, if you were to take the x rays of that in my helicopter crash when Kirk and I were in Santa Paula, uh, the x rays would look very similar between his crash on Dead Man's Curve and my crash in the helicopter at Santa Paula. So you were in a full body cast the same way Mel was? No, like that? because it was years later, I got to, I was able to use external fixators. Oh. The body cast. I hate to say lucky, but that you're lucky. <laughs> they made a big orthopedic change in, in 30 years. So yeah. I was very lucky. My dad always walked with a limp and everything, and I, after a year and a half, I never had any problem. So. Wow, you were lucky. Do you want to uh, mention how your dad ended up? He was in a coma for what, almost two weeks. About two weeks, he was in a coma. We and couldn't arouse him at all. <clears throat> My mom would come there and say, "Mel, Mel," and I go, "Dad, Dad," but we always kept the television on in the ICU. And the television usually twenty. I think at that time about twenty three hours a day we could find. Bugs Bunny, Looney Tunes cartoons. Him. So we always kept the Looney Tunes cartoons on there, just in case. Yeah. One day the doctor walks in and he says, uh, it's an idea, he looks up there and he sees Bugs Bunny and the, the gang. He says, Bugs, can you hear me? Bugs, can you hear me? And my mom and I are sitting there also. And my dad goes, yeah, what's up, Doc? He said, yeah, what's up, Doc? 
And then he said, Porky Pig, can you hear me? He said, yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, I, can hear you. I, I think I can hear you. I can hear you. <laughs> Tweety, can you hear me? Ooh. So he went down, Daffy, <laughs> certainly I hear did, did people think I'm kidding about this, but this all happened. It was documented on on film. That's and incredible. A lot of stories about it. There's a movie in progress right now that's going to be about the 12 days, 13 days, and what went through his mind during those 13 wow. days. Wow, who's playing him? Are you allowed to say? No. Okay. Uh, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> worth a shot. <laughs> anyway, um, but if uh, Radio Lab, the, the uh, PBS station out of New York, uh, uh, did uh, 15 minutes on it that were really terrific. So if you you look at Mel Blanc Radio Lab or just punch in Mel Blanc Radio Lab, you hear the 15 minutes of how he came through this incredible uh, coma 14 days. I was not in a coma. I, I was 20 minutes after my accident, I, I awoke, even though I was, four, uh, I think it was 10 pints of blood were missing. Wow. At that time. Uh, but I awoke and I was pretty lucid after the accident my dad was in a coma for about uh, 14 days now his coma was kind of a it was a big transition point wasn't it because isn't that kind of how you got or how people tried to first get you into doing the voices as yes. well see i always knew that nobody could do the voices like mel he had a special pair of vocal cords. and you call your dad mel so yes. it, that it was well, that always no, the case no, or no, it was always dad pop whatever but now i do and Nobody had vocal cords like Mel. I mean, nobody. He had his eight octave range. He had perfect pitch. You could sit on the piano, and if you sat on the piano, he could tell you what notes you were sitting on. And it, wasn't he the first, um, or like the youngest conductor in the world at one time? Yeah, yeah he was 17, 17 or something? 17 years old and conducting a major orchestra out of Portland, Oregon. Wow! And then, but he had all these incredible facets of, of abilities. And uh, he uh, could listen to an, a dialect and pick it up immediately. Perfect ear. He, had, he could hear it and say it. He could also sing harmony with all the characters just by looking at a Bugs Bunny lead sheet. <laughs> he could sing multiple harmonies uh, wow. on, uh, with any song that he knew. So, yeah, he was a genius. There's nobody been like him. Ever. Right, and they call him the man of a thousand voices, but that's not accurate, is it? Oh, he had 1,500 of them. Right? You, you counted them, didn't you? <laughs> I think in the hospital bed he counted them one time. But anyhow, yeah, amazing, great father. But uh, and, and I was going to say, he everything I hear, everybody loved, everybody him. loved him. Everyone. Yeah, I, I in fact, he, wasn't when he was he was injured and he was in the, the cast, didn't he, that was like the first season of the Flintstones, and the whole cast came to the him. house gathered around the bed and built a studio and everything so that he could yeah, still do Yeah, my mom and I built a studio in another room where we used to sit with Joe Barbera and then I was <laughs> on the machines and the director Alan Dinehart was in the room bedroom under we cabled underneath to their bedroom my dad's legs were out like this the microphone was draped over his head and he did the first 65 episodes of the Flintstones flat on his back do you want to mention who the characters were, just so people know how Barney instrumental? Rubble. Yeah, he was Barney Rubble and Dino the Dinosaur on the Flintstones. Was he uh, the boss also on Jetsons? Okay, yeah. and he also did the Jetsons, of course. Oh yeah, and then Heathcliff, he did all the voices, and uh, there was so many Hanna Barbera cartoons, and invented, of course, the Woody Woodpecker laugh, and did Woody Woodpecker for years and years. And didn't he? Didn't he do that when he was a kid? Yes, in uh, fifth grade. Yeah. Unbelievable. Oh, he, he did all these incredible characters. And what blows me away the most is this is a guy who almost didn't get into this business. When he was going to the studios, nobody would even see him, right? Well, they said, we well, see the studios at that time paid you know, 200 a week to their star actors, and they could use them, utilize them in any way. Right. So even not only the star actors, but the third, fourth, fifth, sixth bunch down the list, they just called those people in to do the voices for the cartoons. And most of them were not cartoon voices. They were actors or actresses. Yeah. So they really couldn't come up with new voices because they didn't have any. Uh, except the ones that they had, <laughs> just their normal speaking voice. Yeah. So, or anybody, everybody always sounded either like Donald Duck or Mickey Mouse. You know? Right, which was what was popular, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yes, he knocked on doors, and especially at Warner Brothers cartoons. And he couldn't get in. They said, we got all the voices we hit need. We've got the people that come out. We're, they're on contract. He says, but can't you just listen to me? No, we got all the voices. He kept knocking at the doors and kept going there maybe every two weeks for a year and a half. Finally, the guy that wouldn't let him in, he died. 
Wow. My dad went to a new guy that was sitting behind the desk. His name was Treg Brown, and he was also the sound effects engineer and the sound effects editor. And my dad auditioned for him, and he says, just wait a minute. There was a Christmas party going on upstairs at Termite Terrace. They went upstairs, and Mel gave him hell with his voices. He had a whole thing that he had written. <laughs> and the next day, he was hired. And what was the first voice that the great Mel Blanc did well, ever? he did a drunken bull to start with. That was the first one. And then he did Porky Pig because... Now, how did he come up with Porky Pig? Porky Pig, they showed him a picture of a pig. And he always says he went out to the pig farm, lolled it around in the... In the <laughs> method mud, actor. Went the mud. He really was a method actor. And I'll tell you a little bit about that. He lolled it around in the mud and uh, he uh, came back and he says... A pig talks with a grunt, 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 So for me, your porky pig talks not with a stutter. It's a grunt. Now we'll go over to the other room and I'll show you something. Excellent. Look at that mural. This was a tapestry. It looks very much like Mel, huh? Absolutely. And of course, very much like Bugs Bunny. How did he come up with Bugs Bunny's voice? Bugs Bunny's voice. Um, I'll, Stand here so you can see Bugs at the back of me. Bugs Bunny's voice is interesting. He says, what's the toughest guy in the world? He says, well, not in the world, but how about the United States? He says, well, either a guy from Brooklyn or the Bronx. So if he combines the two together, then uh, he came up with, nee, what's up, Doc? And he was always, he always won by using his brain. He wasn't Mighty Mouse. He didn't use his bug muscle. He used his brain. And yeah. that's why during the first, the Second World War, he became the strategic figure for Uncle Sam. He was, Bugs Bunny was the one that sold war bonds for Uncle Sam. In every theater, you saw Bugs Bunny, Porky, and Elmer. What a unique idea for bonds. the time. I mean, usually they had superstars, and now they're, they're having cartoon characters. Yes, that that's... and Bugs became the symbol of American freedom. And the most popular cartoon character then for the next 75 years was Bugs Bunny because he was in nose art of the airplanes, he was on sides of ships, and they saw his cartoons in the theaters. Remember, there was no television. Yeah. And they saw his cartoons every day in the theaters. 50 million people a week saw not only a Bugs Bunny Warner Brothers cartoon with Daffy, Porky, Tweety, Sylvester, but they also saw a, a thing that sold a, 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 about a two and a half minute that you, you can find online, a, a venue that says, buy war bonds and the song that went with it was really terrific yeah he had a couple of songs too i mean that, he, well, he, he was the mayor of big bear for a reason right well, he sold he was a bigger seller at Capitol records at one time than either nat king cole or frank sinatra because of the children's records and no television so from 1948 to about 1952 they sold about 17 million records out of, of Capitol uh, of his wow. children's albums but, but before that, and during the wartime, Bugs Bunny became the biggest star. Because in the theaters, if you can imagine, with no television, no matter what show you went to in the theaters, you saw Bugs coming on and selling war bonds. Wow. So, He's a war know, hero in a weird way. Yeah. He, he you know, hit 50 million people a week. Wow. And did Mel ever, I mean, was, it just seems like he was such a modest guy. Did he ever take credit for anything he Not did? Really. No. And say, I, I heard somewhere that he, if he was visiting kids or anything, you had to literally drag him away because he would say hi to everyone, call Every, people. people just... to all the children's hospitals. He must have gone into a, about three or four hundred children's hospitals in the United States when he was touring and making speeches. He went into every children's hospital before he made the speech. Now, how many how many cities was he the mayor of? I I, I know of two, the I believe. Big <laughs> Bear Lake. At the same time. That's unbelievable. Is that even allowed? He's honorary mayor. Because you cut the ribbons and things like that. You're yeah. You're voted mayor and honorary mayor. But, uh, yeah. And, and he was such an amazing uh, person uh, uh, that, that the, the industry itself, all of the people in the industry really loved him because he worked with everybody. At one time, he was doing 18 radio shows a week, so basically he was working with all the great radio stars and most of the uh, motion picture stars that would do radio. And then he eventually brought you into the business as well, didn't he? We started a business in 1961, and 
unfortunately, that was the year of his automobile. Right. Accident. So we sent out the brochures that Mel Blank Associates, now called Blank Communications, was in business, and this is what we were doing, funny commercials. And people got the, the brochure at the same time they got the headlines that Mel Blank even on some of the papers died in a, in a uh, automobile. Truck. Right, isn't that what you first thought? I, I thought well, I read I came somewhere. I downstairs that morning and I saw all the, the papers was the front page. And uh, I think the Hawaii, the Honolulu uh, Herald had a he, Bugs Bunny dies on the front page. Yeah. So that was how close he was to, uh, to death. Wow, and, and then in there, so I know so, he he was kind of a workaholic, wasn't he? He said like he would work three, four different places per day. Sometimes not have lunch. lunch. He, yeah, he would miss he would miss lunch and run from. They were all in one area. NBC, CBS, and ABC were all in one area, and he would really jog between them. They'd hand him a script, and they knew the characters that he was doing. Yeah. So he'd run on stage, and the script was Mel says this, you know, and do his part, and not be. He did very few rehearsals because he was a one, they called him one take blank. He, <laughs> he could go and he knew his part, he knew how to talk, and he knew exactly where it came in the script, and they grabbed the script and go on uh, stage. Right, I think I, I heard an interview with um, someone from the Jets and saying he was the only one in the cast that the director didn't give grief or always say like, hey, maybe you can do this better. He would just do one take and they'd say, good job, Mel. You know, just <laughs> It wasn't because they were afraid of him, because he never got angry. Yeah. The only time Mel would get angry is if the director didn't know what he was doing. Oh, uh, yeah. He says, we can try that a little differently. And finally, after about two of those, Mel said, we, tell me how to do it, and I'll do it that way. Right. But I won't just try it differently. You tell me what you want, and I'll give it to you. And the, and the director was forced to give him what they want, and then he'd do it. Right. Yeah, he very rarely took more than a couple of days. And he was smart enough. Um, one of the things I love about Mel was that when the uh, those early celluloid, they, it was like 24 per second that they would 24 use. 24 frames a second. Yeah, and and, and 24 individual uh, drawings. So they would always have those celluloids left over. And didn't the uh, fire department say it was kind of a fire hazard? So Mel did yeah, something about it. Yeah, originally they were on nitrate, which was a big fire hazard. But then when it became on uh, acetate. Uh, they still became a fire hazard, so Mel just says, well, can I take a bunch of them, to, I'll make Christmas cards out of them. So he'd take three or four hundred of them, and my mom and he would fold the celluloid over and put it on a backing of whatever the color was that year, and he'd write a message on it from Bugs, Porky, Dabby, Tweety, Sylvester, Yosemite, Sam, whoever. Yeah. He had, and a lot of characters to choose from. Yeah. yeah. And Leghorn did a Christmas card, I remember. Pepe Le Pew Pepe and did, oh, Speedy. Yeah. Pepe did a great Easter card. And a, I mean, uh, they, I don't know, Valentine's Day card. Really? Yeah. Oh, that would have been amazing. And Bugs did the Easter cards. And then yeah. he got into giving them out for Halloween too, right? Well, he would give cells out to kids that came over. Well, Halloween, they had about 2,000 kids come by. Wow. What time did people start showing up? Was about one in the afternoon. And Whoa. Ended up about nine at night. And then I got the same thing <laughs> after Mel passed away. Yeah. And I, the, I was living right on the corner at that time of Rodeo, Rodeo Drive and the second street up from um, the half mile of style, whatever they call right, it. Right, right. Rodeo Drive Triangle. About a, a block and a half up, or a block, two blocks exactly up. And so they park on the corner, come in the circular driveway, and I get 1500 on a Halloween also. Wow. And uh, I'd run out of all kinds of candy bars and everything. I'd come out with salad. You know, I didn't <laughs> have anything left. So. Carrots, yeah. <laughs> didn't Mel like carrots? Because he had to eat enough of them. Well, this old saying goes that Mel hated carrots. That's not true. He had to chew on a carrot because it didn't sound like an apple, didn't sound like a potato. It sounded like a carrot. Right. And it's unique, that sound. So try saying, try biting the carrot and chewing it, and then going, me, what's up, Doc? Impossible. So he had to bite the carrot, chew it, hold tape, spit out the carrot, oh. and then say, what's up, Doc? Couldn't say it with a mouth. Right, mouth. right. So people saw him spit the carrot in the wastebasket and said, Mel hates carrots. He spits out the carrots. That was the reason. No, he actually liked carrots. That's amazing. Nowadays, you probably would, wouldn't know a lot of voice actors' names the way that you know Mel Blank, but he, he had a lot of famous friends because he worked with a lot of people back then. Everybody. And didn't, um, who was it, uh, Jack Benny said that Mel was his favorite actor? Not yes. voice actor, but actor. Yes, and so did uh, 
uh, Abbott and Costello said the same thing, because he was an incredible actor. He was a method actor. He was as much Stanislavski acting method as anybody that ever lived. Yeah, and it wasn't voices, it was characters. He had to create a he, whole... Not only that, I could turn the sound off in the booth, and he could be in the other room in, against the glass partition there. And I'd watch him, and I knew what characters he was doing, because he actually... I guess you would call it transmogrified into Yosemite Sam. Or the, the Tasmanian devil. His face, is, he had a rubber face. Yeah. So he became these characters. So watching him was actually, and he, he was those characters when he did the voices. So watching him was actually amazing because he became the character. That's great. And he was a character in real life too, wasn't he? I, I heard a story about some of the things that used to happen. Well, I mean, actually for one thing, this house in Big Bear is kind of historical. It was on historical property that he, that you guys all live on, right? Wasn't yes, this, this like is, a... This is the sawmill of the Big Bear. When they took the trees down to make the lake before they dammed it up, this was a valley and it was full of pine trees. And they cut down the pine trees and the sawmill was right here where this house stands. My mom and I found this house the day the Second World War ended. And we brought my dad down here the next day because we couldn't believe how beautiful it was. We found it on our bicycles. My dad rode his bike and we all came down here. He, caught a, he brought his fishing pole with him and caught his limit of trout in about an hour and a half. He says, boy, I like this lot. I'm going to come back here. So we kept coming back the whole summer uh, to this location. And he finally said, I wonder if the fellow wants to sell it. I'll find out who has it. So he called the county and found out the guy did want to sell it. And Mel said, how much? He says, uh, is 600 too much? And, and Dad goes, no, it's okay. Wow. So we got the lot for 600 The house probably ran about, what, 3500 Yeah. And we've been in it ever since. And, and it's a beautiful location. Um, one of the things that I found out before I ever met you, I read online was that your dad and you both like to do something out on the dock when you have boats go by. Would you oh, like to? Yes. <laughs> I don't know if any are going by today, but I just I think that's know. a funny thing. I don't think so. No, not this early. They come right into the cove and they sit there until I go out on the porch right here that you can see. And I come out with my bullhorn. My dad used the megaphone too. And we talk through this. And they, they can hear me all the way across the lake with us. And you do voices. You do the characters oh, yeah, and just... do the characters. And we have a lot of fun with the boats that come in. One of my favorite stories, actually there were two, if I can get you to tell them, was one was the, uh, the you guys were having um, chicken and someone was stealing Andy Devine's chicken. That story? Oh, Jack Benny. <laughs> yeah, and he was putting it in his pocket or something. He had this beautiful windbreaker that a friend of his gave. Uh, George Burns gave it to him, actually. This beautiful wind windbreaker from a very expensive shop in Beverly Hills and he wore it up here because he was going out on the boat and he figured he needed a nice windbreaker and Mel said well let's go over to Andy Devine's because he just opened a restaurant here and he's got a little chicken restaurant next door to the to the main restaurant we can have all the chicken we can eat and Jack says that's fine so Jack my dad and myself went over to the Andy Devine's the chicken restaurant I got chicken or whatever it was. yeah and uh, Andy came in and greeted us and everything and we sat there and but we I, all of a sudden, I see more chicken consumed than there is bones. <laughs> like it's disappearing into and thin I, air. Where the heck does a chicken go? And then I see Jack taking the chicken, wrapping it in the napkin, and putting it in his windbreaker. And he wraps the next piece up, put it in his windbreaker. He says, I got food for tomorrow when we go fishing. <laughs> Until we got to the door when my mom... <laughs> Open the door and said, Jack, what happened to your jacket? And he looks down, there's grease spots. <laughs> <laughs> All over this beautiful jacket that never came out, obviously. That's <laughs> amazing. But, uh, oh yeah, Jack had a lot of fun. He brought his daughter up here. And we water skied off of this dock, the blue one that you see down there. And uh, that was in 1949, 48, 49. He came up a few summers. And he loved it up here with his daughter. And we'd sit on the porch, the other porch that you took a, a, sh a shot of, and uh, the enclosed porch, and we'd uh, barbecue there and sing songs. Jack would play the fiddle, Dad would play the fiddle. When George Burns would come up to, he'd sing or try to sing. George always thought he had a great voice. <laughs> and uh, we'd have a great time on the porch eating and singing all night. 
Now you got a crazy phone call one time, didn't you? That ended up you guys going out on the lake with someone pretty famous. Oh, yes. So, you know, people used to call Mel all the time and say, hi, I'm Jimmy Seward, or hi. How did they have his phone number? Because he's listed. He's still listed in the book up here. <laughs> under Mel Blank. Same phone number. So they'd call him, and they would do impersonations. And he'd listen sometimes. Sometimes he'd go, who is this? Is this really Jimmy Stewart? And I no, this is so-and-so, so-and-so, and I do Jimmy Stewart, and I do G George Jessel, and I do... Trying to impress him, basically. Yeah, Milton Bro I yeah, they try to impress him with different characters. So we get a call one day. My dad, mom, and I are sitting here, and uh, the uh, the person on the other end of the line, I call. Uh, he calls him, and he says, Hi, this is Elvis Presley. I said, Oh, Dad. <laughs> This one's good. This is Elvis Presley. <laughs> I said, yes, Elvis. He says, I hear uh, Mel's up here, and I'm doing a picture up here, uh, kissing cousins, and uh, I'd like to come down and see him. I got a break. I said, gee, that's that's great, Elvis. Um, when can you come down? He says, well, I, I'm about 10 minutes away. I says, well, we'll see you in 10, 15 minutes. Huh? He says, yeah, I'll be driving a, car, a, a black convertible. Oh, okay, but okay, Elvis. Hung up. I says, Dan, Elvis and I, Elvis says he's coming down to meet you. He's a big fan, and he's coming down in a black convertible. Shall we walk up the street and see who it really is? So we walk up the street, and we turn back, go to the, our driveway, and I, we don't see anybody. And about 10 minutes later, down the street comes a black convertible with one person driving, nobody else. And behind the wheel is Elvis Presley. Wow, I'm a huge Elvis fan. And he turns in the driveway, parks the car, jumps out of the car, grabs my dad. Mel, I loved your photo. I love everything you do. Do Porky, do Daffy, do Tweet. Do <laughs> he wants to see the impressions. In the driveway. So dad says, come on in, we'll sit down where you were sitting earlier. Yeah. Before. In fact, Elvis sat in that chair. I sat in the Elvis chair? Yeah, that's the Elvis Whoa. chair. Whoa! Anyhow, uh, so, yeah, all the furniture is still the same. Um, and he's, he looks out and he sees the dock down there and he sees the boat. And I always back the boat in because the waves come in and we want the bow to hit it. And it says Bugs Bunny on the boat. He says, your boat, Mel? I say, yes, that's my boat. He says, uh, let's take a ride. So like most of movie stars, like whoever has been up here before, Jack didn't want to drive. Kirk Douglas always wanted to drive the boat. The stars drive the boat, the and they're out. Drive the boat. Uh, can, can I drive? And Dad says, "Okay." But do you see the buoys out there? They've got this five mile an hour out to the buoys, so take it easy. So Elvis jumps in the boat, and it's pointed straight out, and floors it. <laughs> and we're doing fifty miles an hour because my dad had a hopped up Chevy engine in the boat, and we're doing fifty miles an hour by the time we reach the buoys. He makes a left turn, heading for the dam. And we're heading for the dam at a pretty rapid speed, but coming alongside of us is a much faster boat, a yellow jacket with a giant outboard on it. And we look over, we slow down, and it's Roy Rogers. No kidding, the cowboy. <laughs> now Roy used to spend a lot of time with us on the dock and everything and his kids, because he lived up here and he owned certain pieces of property that were on the lake and that were commercial pieces of property. Okay. So, Roy goes and he does a triple take and looks over because it's Elvis driving the boat. Yeah. And he goes, so we all slow down and we, we turn off the motors and for, I would say, it must have been an hour and a half, an hour and 15, an hour and a half, I heard Hollywood stories between Roy who had never met Elvis and Roy who knew my dad, of course, and my dad and myself listening to them tell stories and I, I remember Elvis looking at his watch and says, oh, I'm late for the shoot. I gotta get going. We came back to the dock. He ran, got his car, and took back up. To what an experience! Those are three people who are maybe the most famous in their field. In their field, the most famous. Roy Rogers, by far, the most famous cowboy ever lived. Yeah. Elvis Presley, most famous singer that ever lived, and my dad, most famous voice that ever lived. Only thing you were missing were one of those presidents that you have in the hallway. <laughs> 
So yeah, that was some day. So what, was this Mel, like where did Mel like to live the most? Is it, Where did he spend most of his time? Or was he always working he, so often he that... He wished he could live here most of the time, but it got too cold. And that's why we leave too, right. periodically during the winter. But uh, he was a beach person like we are. Uh, he lived at the beach. I grew up on the beach. Played El Rey, then Venice, Ocean Park, and, play, and Pal uh, uh, Pacific Palisades. I sound like, Pee Parky, Pee Pig, Pee Pacific, Pee Pop, Pee Pig. You know what I'm talking about. Anyhow, so that's where he lived. Played El Rey, Pacific Palisades his whole life. Once he married my mom, and we were here from 1938 on. So, uh, yes, he was a beach person, and then he'd come up here and sing. That's what we do. Now, there's something I kind of wanted to bring up that you mentioned me when I first met you. I just find so fascinating. You said, I used to have a million-dollar life insurance policy on Vincent Price. And I said, how is that? You have a whole history of Vincent Price. Oh, Vincent Price and I were friends, and we worked together. He was a wonderful man. Brilliant man. In fact, in every kind of area, he was brilliant. Do you want to mention what it was that you guys worked together? So if people want to look for it? a thing called Odyssey. It's not on the air now. They were actually the first 250 or 60 were for Best Western Hotels. And they were short clips, maybe two and a half minutes long, sponsored by Best Western, that told about different places that odd things happened in the United States. Interesting. These 250 shows. Then the uh, Armed Forces Radio and Television heard those shows and said, Will you do another 260 for us? So we did another. So we had 500 shows that we had to do. Wow. And I thought I better take a life insurance policy out on Vincent. <laughs> yeah. So I took a life insurance policy out. I went to the doctor, and he was rated six, which is not good. Really? Yeah. Was it smoking maybe? or? No, they figured that it was rated six. So I what, was, what era was this maybe years? Uh, 73, 4, 5, 6. Okay, so he lived... For a while after oh that. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Oh, it's so funny because I was paying about 50000 a year for his life insurance policy. And he was as healthy and we traveled. We <laughs> went to London and did things there. and We did shows there. Anyhow, he comes to me one day, I remember, when we were still doing some shows. He says, I just got the greatest gig. And I said, what, what's the gig, Vincent? And uh, Mr. Price says, I'm going to... <laughs> 